could be overrun. I'm going to stand there, okay. yeah. and I think because um, it sort of will move around, Mike. Too. Thanks, Mary. Mike. Hi. Hi, dear. Hi, dear. I know. <laughs> Oh yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's pull it that close We're just conscious of being a little part, really. Oh, sure. so much. No, I just think that the table is probably ideal for people to like a major part. So we can do it like that. Yeah, 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 we
for us as people wondering that that is Yeah. Cool. All right. Do you want to say white cat boots? Uh, we'll be all right. Yeah. Just, uh, just, uh, <laughs> 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 oh, here she comes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, she's even found a pink cloth to go with yeah. her shirt. Like the and the pink lady. Yeah. Oh. I've still got to be on it. But he's the one who was doing all the work oh. at the scene. Yeah. So I think we should owe you a round of applause. Yeah. 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 So, kia ora everybody. Um, thank you for coming along to our female dominated writing workshop. Yeah. <laughs> Except for mine. Yay, yeah, yeah, for the women, that's good. Have you got some paper with you to write with? If, if not, we have some and we have a purple pen. And so, yes, yeah, so my name's Mary McCallum. This is my Simmons, am I right in saying Simmons, that? Yes. Yeah, even though there's only one M mm -hmm. in it, do not be misled, because my Simmons. Um, and we've got a session, of course, as you may have seen, called Finding with Joy. And I just read you what we think we're going to do. Too often poetry is seen as a haven for the depressed, lonely, and grieving when it has a history that also embraces praise and the art of delighting in things. So you're going to join us. Um, in a workshop designed to help you write from the perspective of delight and approach even the most difficult material with an eye for elements that are uplifting or even joyful, which could mean all kinds of things, but hopefully we'll <laughs> take you into our reading of that. Michael is the author of Michael, I Thought You Were Dead. Yes. Wonderfully yes. named. Yes. Book. <laughs> Very up to the field. I've got a big cover, and I'm the author of, oh, that's in my hand. It's such a battered copy of the um, XYZ of Happiness. Uh, that would sound more uplifting, I guess. Doesn't look it though. God, that's like a wreck. Um, so we're going to briefly introduce ourselves and then ask you each to give a little smidge about yourselves um, and what you're writing or perhaps why you're here. Um, and then we'll go and get into some workshopping. So, do you want to start with you? Sure, sure. So, yes, I'm, I'm Mike Fitzsimmons. Um, I've been involved with writing. I've, I've written for a living, really, for 30 years in one form or another. Had a, um, a writing and publishing and communications company. Um, we published all sorts of books and did all sorts of writing. And part of the writing was poetry. I've always loved writing poetry. So um, I wrote some poetry and published one book. And Mary's published the second book for me. Um, I'm a father and my grandfather. I live in Wellington by the sea, and that setting is everywhere in my books. Um, I love writing. I love trying to get better at it. Uh, it's fascinating. I was just at the Simon Sweetman session, and it was brilliant. And he's a blogger, and it's, he's just prolific, absolutely prolific. And I'm sort of the other way, really. I'm, I'm a poet, and I'm always, I'm always throwing stuff away, and I'm unhappy with it. And so it's just a completely different dynamic that I, I wish I was a bit more like him, actually. Mm. But anyway, that's, that's me to begin with. Mm. Cool. And could you just quickly tell us what was behind that Oh, book? yeah, sure. So th yeah. this book, so, and it, it brings us to the topic of the um, discussion. The, the topic, uh, the title, Michael, I Thought You Were Dead, um, I was diagnosed with cancer <coughs> in uh, 2016, and I thought I got over it, and then it came back. Uh, unexpectedly and 
And so I tried to, um, I, I worked out that writing poetry was my way of facing danger. And it became literally a kind of a daily, a daily little lifeline. Um, and so the title, Michael, I Thought You Were Dead, is a, a true statement. It's a little found poem in its own right because I went to Unity Books one day to the, for a book launch of um, a poet's book, a, a poet I knew a little bit. And uh, I got, uh, afterwards I went up to him and said, would you sign the book? And he looked up at me and he said, uh, Michael, I, I thought you were dead. So we word had got round, we had got round. So I went home anyway and I uh, said to my wife, Rose, I told her the story. And she said, oh, that, that's the title of the book. And, uh, and so it has turned out to be. So yes, so this, this book is a record of, mainly a record of coping with that issue and trying to find some joy and life in that situation and how could I communicate and translate what is obviously such a seriously existential threat into a form of art, into something that would not just be self-expression, but something which a reader coming to it, you know, could get from it. So that, that was kind of, that's the task I set myself. Um, so that's the book. And he said it successfully because I, as a publisher, so I'm a publisher with Marco Press and the Cuba Press. I won't explain why I've got two presses, it's a very long story, but uh, under the Cuba Press imprint, I published this book. So when I read it, I don't <coughs> like books that just take me down a rabbit hole and are bloody depressing and then dangling. It's just not me. And I've got to work with it for a long time as an editor and then a publisher. And, I don't mean that downer. <laughs> so I like books that even I, you know, obviously you know, work can be moving or sad, but yeah. I like to look for, um, I guess, a delight somehow in there, like whether it's in the language used or the um, the elements that a person finds to talk about in talking about a big or depressing or sad event. And I guess Mike, when he spoke to me, I loved it, so that's why we published it. Um, so for my own work, I'm also a writer and I published a novel um, under the Penguin Books many years ago uh, that won a couple of awards and should have propelled me on to my second novel, but instead it just took me into a realm of writing a manuscript for 12 years. Um, and I keep coming back to it, but I think I might have lost the thread a bit on that. I have uh, also published a children's book called Dapple Danny and the Tigrish with Gecko Press, which was a great delight to me. Um, and did well in America, but not necessarily here, so that's all right. And then I um, have always written poetry from the age of eight and published it and used to publish it, you know, in landfall and the like, and then I kind of went off it for a while. I get easily distracted, is the truth about me. But um, then I had all these poems and I thought I'm really going to have to do it because I'm encouraging other people to get their work out there. So I'm going to do something with it. And I had honestly hundreds, but I thought I can't handle that, so I, I decided I would collect together ones that I wanted to be a bit contrary. My name is Mary, right? <laughs> um, and, I, and we're always told that happiness writes white, and that's kind of an idea that is perpetrated by such as Bill Mannheim. The idea being that you can't see it on the page; it doesn't do much for you. Usually, we like you know, the sad, the depressing and all of that, it speaks to us, it does something more on the page, I guess. And then I saw Andrew Motion, the UK poet, say that, um, yes, it does write white, and therefore you need a black background to see it, which I thought was fabulous. In other words, the beauty and happiness, the joy, the delight, against something darker is when you notice that, when you value it. So it doesn't mean that every poem in the X, Y, Z of happiness <laughs> is happy. But they've got, there are some quite sad ones and difficult ones in there, but um, there's always a moment, I think, of joy. And it's about finding that moment, that either that thing I write about is joyful, or I think, for me as a poet, it's the joy of language, which I think every poet feels that you're really, you're really pushing words out to the nth degree in poetry. You can play with them, do things with them that perhaps you can't always elsewhere. So, yes, it's XYZ because I just basically took 26 poems and then alphabet, each one's got a title starting with an A, B, C, D, etc. And that's it, three little slim little volume, but it was very satisfying to bring out. And I've also brought out a little chapbook, um, which sits somewhere and I keep forgetting where, but there we go. So that's, that's, that's my own work. Um, and now I'd like to hear, Mike and I would like to just hear briefly from you, are you working on something now? And it has to be read because I know with authors, you start from hard to stop. <laughs> so you can think a couple of sentences about 
what you're working on and perhaps maybe why you're here. Yeah. My name's Sue and I work here. Um, oh. And I'm on one of the poet you know, short story writer. Um, so like, I do write um, and I've got like hair piles, you know, yeah. with yeah. stuff on, <laughs> yeah. um, which is stashed in a desk which my children will probably mm -hmm. find after I'm gone. And, she wrote. She wrote. She wrote. Yeah. So I think yeah, for me it's a confidence thing of like you know and what what to do with them. But I probably yeah. just, just stay in my drawer. I don't know. Okay, we can talk yeah. about that more. Yes. Um, I'm Caroline, and I have to say I'm very much the same as what Sue is. I've written and I've got you know stuff home too but to go further in the family mm. and friends um mm. I can't get to see it when I want to do it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm Say it loudly so that so you know. I'm Paula. I've been um, a professional writer in terms of I've got a background in PR and in um, uh, journalism but uh, I do have a pile of uh, creative writing that I'm looking at and thinking I want to do something with it. I'm, I'm inclined towards the one who I, but that, then it's got to be organised. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to take the lead, isn't it? Yeah, forget you. Um, I nice and loud. Oh, sorry, sorry. my name is Tula, and I write for Brent Lowry. I'm afraid to go to university. But I need to think of people to like learn about myself and see what I'm attracted to. And I think that's cool. great. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. She said she's Every afraid day. to go to university, but she thinks she should. <laughs> just if you miss that. I think just having heard Simon Sweet before, he said um, there are writers who say I'm too busy to read, and he said he said like you're too, what did he say? Well, you're too busy being a shit writer. Yeah, <laughs> he says writer. you've got to you've got to read. You've got to find read <laughs> widely to know what you're ready to do yourself. Yeah, cool. Hi, my name's Mary. Um, I didn't write to. I sort of left home, kids left, left mm. my husband, <laughs> and I started writing. Well, well that, that happens to yeah. us, yeah. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, I'm not talking of like mm. just about 60, I suppose. Mm. So I just, just self published them, and I just, I do give them to my children, and, you know, and um, I have <coughs> sold a few, but mm. I'd like to know what else you can do with them, really. Nice. Mm. And keep yeah. writing. Great. Mm. I'm Elizabeth, I'm a bit of a fraud because I don't do poetry, but I really enjoy reading it. Oh, cool. yeah. um, <laughs> that's a good start. That's a good start. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a lot of published in a book. Nice. Um, and I'm just trying to write more, but it's more about being my reader for a book that's happened over my life. That's fine. The ups and downs and things like that, but just getting myself back started. Yeah. I'm the computer sits there and looks at me. No, well, it can't be bad. No, you do just need to get yes. that. I've written down this one on my list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What it's, again, sign, I'm going to keep quoting him. He says, the best thing about him is the writer's who fronts up. So that's the start. Yes. Yeah. Chris. Um, Chris, I write fiction. Never really go handle on poetry. I like writing song lyrics. But every time I write poetry, it seems to be very self indulgent and missing the song. So, quite interesting um, to find out. Nice. That's how poetry works. Okay, cool. Renee. Hi, my name's Renee, I'm a writer. Um, and I, just, I come along this afternoon because I love poetry, I love reading it, and I love trying to write it. But I also like being taught it as well. You know, and hearing different ideas and things um, because they remain, like after we all gone home, the ideas remain. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Cool. So I'm Nicola, and I'm a full-time teacher and uh, I'm off on the Kapiti Coast and I'm here because it's a real treat to be a student for a change. I'd actually prefer to be a full-time student but I have to teach. Well, I, no, I love teaching but like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I couldn't make money out of the poetry. Um, I have got a couple of collections of poetry out and my latest one is with the Cuba Priest with Mary. Um, yeah, and that's it. Cool. Hi, Kira, I'm Mandy. Um, I mainly write fiction and non-fiction. So the poetry I've written is angsty and private. Um, <laughs> There's a role for angsty and private. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm Michelle. I've written a little story for my ex. It's all about 
not the guitar as I remember, four or five. Um, when I was in my teens, um, I did excel to English and got some um, short, short stories and poetry published in various little um, mm. educational, um, education gazette <coughs> and um, various children's magazines that used to be given out free at the library and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then got married, had babies and things like that. And now, um, about three years ago, two years ago, my life completely imploded. Mm. Like every area of my life, um, yeah, kind of just imploded and just fell apart. Mm. Um, and I'm now at the stage where um, shell shock is starting to wear off. And mm. I need to start writing some things down. I really feel like I need to. I've been, I've been, I'm one of these people that have random bits of paper and write on, you know, write just ideas pop in my head and I put them down on a bit of paper mm. and I put them on blocks and put them on, you know, send me some notes in my phone and things like that. And I, mm. Yeah, I really want to get back into doing some poetry and some short mm. stories. But because of all the, the, the yucky stuff, mm. um, finding that joy, this is my joy jersey. That's mm. very joyful. Um, <laughs> very joyful. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I need to find a balance between all that angsty kind of stuff mm. and um, not being yeah. completely depressive. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Good on you. Well, you've got a yeah. nice And story. it's on the bucket list, the bucket list to um, get a, a book of poetry and a book of short, short stories and stuff like that on my bucket list. So. Mm. Yeah, they say a creative. I haven't written anything for like 28 years, not like literally. Oh, a so lot of people go through those things in their lives and they just say. I that forgot that I missed it. Mm. A creative person, stymie, can be a kind of like an ingrowing toenail, I think. You know, <laughs> I, I don't too. Um, I create stuff. a knit and do fiber craft, I do all sorts of other creative stuff. Mm. I didn't realise until mm. I, two or three months ago how much I actually missed mm. writing. And I'm Kirsty. I describe myself as a bad poet. I suppose I've had about four and apologies. And um, I wrote a novel which was published last year, and it's got about um, 15 poems in it on behalf of a uh, woman who's in a mental hospital. So I didn't feel I had to write them to, you know, reach a hugely high um, standard. Yeah. And I'm, I think, a wee bit opposite to Michael. I tend to just write things. And put them up immediately on Instagram. There's <laughs> draft, bang, gone. Do you know what I mean? And there's often I'm just, it's just my <coughs> moment or my mood and all about that particular time. I'm yeah. envious. <laughs> and they great your posts. I read them. So they, yeah, they're terrific. I admire people who do that. I tend to hang on to it while myself, like Mike does. Well, thank you all. Thanks for sharing it. It's just good to know where people's thinking comes from. I just think there's a couple of interesting things about what you're saying. I think one is that people say, you know, I've got the poems in there in the drawer and I'm, you know, I might do something with them, I don't know what to do with them, and all these kind of toing and froing. I think the important thing is to see yourself as a writer and call yourself that, and just be clear about it with yourself and with other people. That really helps, and then it tells you really what next to do. If you want to call yourself the poet, that's great, or the novelist, or just call yourself that. I, was, I went through that phase because I hadn't published poetry for a while, sort of saying I was an erstwhile poet, I was this, I was that. And I know Renee has taught creative writing, so I don't know what she's doing these days, but anyway, <laughs> lovely to have you. But she, and the big thing people say about her classes is that she says to people, you are a writer, you know, just go home if you don't think you are, basically. She's quite tough, I'm not like that, but you know. So that's an important thing. It works, um, yes. it works. It does work. You oh, say it to yourself <laughs> and you value it and you tell others and then you move on. You have to keep going. You cannot just look at the screen and say it might come to me and open up and tell me all these things I should write. You just have to write. So those two things are good takeovers. So what we, um, the, the critical thing I think we want to show is that how we um, used poetry to write, obviously a variety of things, our work's quite different, but I guess even when material's difficult, when life can be difficult, you can still write about it, but poetry, you've got something there for you. And one of the things we were talking about this that matters, I think, in understanding what poetry does and um, what you can do yourself in writing it, is this idea of um, paying radical attention, which is something that writers should be doing anyway and you're talking about taking notes and that sort of thing and that's critical like you, that you notice something you might throw I use my phone a lot to put notes and you know, people carry notebooks and do what they like but you know you're, you're paying radical attention when you're out in the world and seeing things trying to see things differently it's a lovely phrase that you got from Billy, Billy Collins, Collins, Billy yeah. Collins yeah. and we're talking about that and part of that is 
really noticing concrete thing, things as they are in the world, the concrete, because often we get overcome with our feelings about things when actually um, it's really important as a writer to see things and present what you see to people. And the way you see them will bring the emotion with it, will, will draw something out of your readers. If you push too much emotion out there, if you put too much that's abstract in work, it can turn people off because the abstract's enormous. It's huge, you know, the word love, you know. What does it mean? It's too big to light upon or grab or for it to be meaningful for readers, let alone for yourself. So the concrete, which is the stuff we see, the chair, the table, the man on the chair with the pen, and how he's flicking through his book while I'm talking and is he listening to me or not, but we won't go there. But that is a concrete world and it can do a hell of a lot for you. It's also easier to write than the big and abstract and difficult, actually. And it can be a kickoff for you, like a way of doing the writing that's so hard. It's just to sit down and like, yeah, yeah. right. Absolutely. Um, Shall we read a couple of the Yeah, show we're going to share yeah. a little bit, um, yeah. a couple of poems, so to sort of illustrate what we mean. Talk about. And if you want to talk about, so one, one yeah, the, the way of walking with you and the brain. Yeah, well, I think one of the things, like objects, and that is, you pay radical attention to that, but what I found, um, and what I tried to capture in this book, was paying attention to my mind and my thoughts, and where, when it's under great stress, and you were mentioning it, and like, crisis in life, you know, mm. I think it's about honouring the whole human experience, you know, it's all, you know, there's, there's the brilliant and the wonderful and then there's the sad and the suffering and the great teachers in life, I, I believe, are, are love and suffering. And it's watching what happens to your mind when, when that happens um, and seeing that as in quite concrete terms, as Mary was saying. Anyway, this is, this is a poem about a lemon tree um, and a in a way, it's actually a poem about my mind, but it's a poem about a lemon tree. Mug of tea smokes the cool air. Breathe as easily as you please. Today, for once, I surrender everything I do not need. Sit quietly in a corner of the room of my mind, in a green sunlit corner of the planet, in a jackpot corner of the cosmos, when you think about it. But let go of all thoughts. Lay them down on this hallelujah morning and look, look at that little lemon tree in the rain, all yellow fruit, no tree, all yellow fruit, no tree, all yellow fruit, no tree. So in a way, like for me, there was the absolute specificity of that lemon bush, um, and it, but it was, I don't know if you've seen those little lemon trees quite often. <coughs> They have, they have this ridiculously big fruit for a very vulnerable, spindly little tree. Um, and that's the vulnerability of that kind of really appealed to me. I just thought that physicality of that tree. Yeah. You can just see it. Like, can see it's that. glowing at you, those yellow. And the way you emphasize it at the end so we can't avoid it. Yes, it really. Um, and the other thing I, I tried to do in well, the second half of the book, I've called Markings. And I don't know if you know a book called. Um, Markings by Dag Hammarskjöld. Back, it was a real sen publishing sensation in the um, 70s, I think. He was Secretary General of the United Nations, a very, very important man, and he was highly respected and regarded, and had this massively busy public life. And secretly, he he wrote down his thoughts and his kind of um, spiritual, his interior life. He, he, he kept a wonderful diary and uh, it wasn't found he, he died in a plane accident and then they found his book and published it mm -hmm. and it's magnificent really and it was called markings and I, I remember reading it thinking you know, one day I would love to write markings so I suddenly thought here's my opportunity to write my little markings in a really humble way so I'll just write a few uh, I'll just read a few of these and these um, in a way suit um, suit if, if you're not feeling great if you're sick if you're on chemotherapy if you're in grief or whatever, um, I still found it incredibly helpful to be able to go and just write down a marking, just a short thing. Because sometimes trying to get a big finished polished poem mm -hmm. is, a, is a big ask, you know, and whereas going back and back to this desk as I used to uh, during that period, and then just jotting down the little things was terrific. It 
this, you know, it's a, and it's, it's incredible, the satisfaction, when you get a sentence down that you're happy with, I mean, that's why we're all here, isn't it, you know, like, the amount of satisfaction, it's hard, very hard to explain to non-writers, I think, but the amount of satisfaction you get out of just being true to yourself, just getting it down in a way that you feel very good with is the buzz, you know, without being Just say, so often you just pinned off something that happened in your day, didn't you? you yes. Yeah, and you just go and write about it. A absolutely. Well, I, I, here's a few markings. So, I find a throne beside the sea and sit there in all weathers, how small I am. The good day is a wild day. I say goodbye to my inflated self. It feels like freedom. I have an unenviable opportunity to renew myself. I have a new interest in cosmology, in the enormity of the universe, a trillion galaxies, more planets than grains of sand. I have a new interest in our insignificance. Every day in every way I'm getting stronger. I say this often enough and studies show it works, even if you don't believe it. I say this often enough and you might go nuts. <laughs> Slowing down is the beginning of life. I read that somewhere. Great literature speaks to the unspeakableness of life. I read that somewhere too. What can I say that is unspeakably me? I am up off the canvas. The people in my life lift me up. I call myself a tall gin and tonic. I think if I were a wildebeest on the savannah, I would have been left behind by them. And then, you know, just little things that happen. This is, a, you know, over a bowl of sultana grain, apropos of nothing, my eight-year-old grandson says he would rather be shot than get sick and die slowly. Mm. What do you think, Granddad? On a rainy Tuesday afternoon, we eat lamingtons and play cards with the kids. Happy, happy families, last card and stop the bus with three matches each and one free ride. A voice says to me, come to the edge, where it is quiet. Come ready or not, dip your fingers in a bowl of water. Bless your broken self. And finally, a photo shoot. Photo shoot in the mist. Our family comes together, three generations on the shore of Wursa Bay. In the soft light, arms around each other, we stop the march of time. Our bright faces. This is who we are. So, in a way, it's just trying to be. Um, follow the movement of the mind and being curious about that as a subject and trying to get it down very simply. Um, that, that was sort of the technique. And, and there was a positivity and a joy in doing that even though my own plight was anything but joyous. But that, you know, so it's interesting, I suppose it's writing as therapy, but hopefully it can be writing as something that's creative and positive and affirming. And then, but then again there and you've got these wondering thoughts, but these are the very specific, like, um, for gin and tonic, and the family photo shoot in the rain. You can just see it right there, and they'd be like, come on, you know, line up, just pull the rain, pull it. So there's those, those elements that can lock your brain in on the physical, and then from there you can feel the emotion. Yeah. I, think, I think that's absolutely right. It's, it's like you, you've got to earn the abstraction, don't you, with yeah. like, like having <laughs> enough concrete thing, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Then you can jump to a generality or an abstract emotion, but you just need a, you need a lot of that. Do you want to join us or? Oh, I mean, right. If you want You're to, very welcome. Maybe very welcome if you want. There's probably a chair or two. Yeah. This one's here. Yeah. Let's <coughs> take it. It's poetry writing, right? You know that? <laughs> oh, you're supporting your wife? Because you, you might know she might be the only guy apart from the poet in the room there, but that's okay. Here you go. Can I ask, do you write a diary? No, I don't. No, I don't actually, but I mean, I, I just, you know, I always scribble down thoughts or anything that. You know, what I'm noticing, I just, I do do that, but I just put little scraps of paper, really. Yeah. 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 Are you want to write a diary? Um, no, I used to. Um, and then um, my husband found it once and read it. And that, honestly, it's a true story. It devastated me and never wrote one again. Well, I didn't think I did. Every now and then I write notes about what's going on, but I prefer to put it into my, the radical attention to be paid and go into my poetry. <laughs> Keep a bit of, you know, mental privacy, I guess, around it. It sounds, sounds like he sounds terrible, so there's a long story behind me. 
the diary read. But I do believe I take a lot of notes, and I just talk them into my phone, actually, as I'm walking to work. And sometimes those are a bit like your poems, that what you post on Instagram, because I've got the, this long ramble about things I'm seeing with the walking. And if I look at it, I think, oh, that's not bad. That's almost a poem, and then go back and play with it later. So I find that it's almost like a diary. <laughs> it sort of is. No, but it's not really. It's not about what's in the head. It's what I'm seeing. And I think that I love that. Like, I find... When I'm properly writing, I really do pay really good attention. I really do notice things. Like when I'm thinking, I think I do, do it as a poet, but I think when I'm writing a novel, even more so, because a novel is so demanding, isn't it, Christine? Like, you know, Mandy and those who Rene have written novels, you, you need so much for a novel that you find you're always looking out to find what you can grab and pull in because, yeah, it's a big, big beast to, to fill. Anyway, so I'll just talk, um, yeah, I guess. Um, I, yeah, the thing of finding, I, li I liked with Mike um, that he told me how he'd often just go out on a walk or a cycle ride or something and just look at stuff and come home or something. Mm. It could even be running into another guy with a bike who's also going through being therapy and you know, yes. have that chat and there's this little moment which you catch. But on the page they look a little bit like prose, some of them, some like poetry and they're kind of broken up and one leads to another and somehow there's a cumulative effect which is quite lovely and there often is in a collection anyway so for me yeah I did I did some interesting things because when I decided on the happiness idea I felt I thought um, I looked and I did have poems that were deeply happy and just moments and um, and they were fine I could use those if they worked if they were just joyous blips you know they had mm -hmm. something else going on but I then decided I really had to kind of try and write some that hadn't sprung out of something perhaps negative or different, because we often go very quickly into writing out of those experiences. So I decided one day um, I would look out the window at my husband, <laughs> the one who read the diary. Um, yeah, that was the one. Um, and I, what I decided was that I was always quick to, you know, when I was younger, when we were together, I write these very negative poems about our relationship. And I was failing on all counts. Anyway, so I thought, no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write a love poem, which is not really unusual. So that was that thing of making a decision. And I was going, I, he was outside in his blue nightshirt watering the trees. We've got an olive grove, um, the saplings, which he did in his nightshirt, by the way. And I thought, I'd just look out the window and um, I'll, I'll just write what I see. So this is on tree, of trees. He tends to and is tender to the trees in a way I am not. Each morning in a blue nightshirt, he takes a bucket of water and a cup to the avenue of saplings. He beckons and bends this way and that, tipping cup after cup as if filling mouths until the bucket runs dry. Only then he looks up, all around, trees he's tended for 20 years, some so high they make an avenue of the sky. As he breathes in the green air, there is a greater breath as if in giant lungs. It nudges the saplings, nudges the blue nightshirt, so it clings to the bare runner's legs of the man who is my husband. I think of how this man visits his trees in the morning as he comes to his wife at night, lightly all limbs tender in the way of tending curious about the invisible workings of living things. He stands in the wind now, head tilted, listening in, as I listen in to him. That's great. So, it sounds nice. Yeah, and do you know what? It was really good for me. Like, it was a really, I mean, it wasn't written like that at the time. Obviously, I wrote it and I've refined it and done things with it since, which you should always do, I have to say. But I, I think, but I, it was, um, it was I, when I think about it, I don't think I determined to write a love poem. I think I determined just to look out the window and watch, in fact. And what it became was that love poem. So that's often where things go, you don't always expect it. But it's based on exactly those things I was seeing and what they led me to think. And it's that tenderness you feel towards mm -hmm. someone when you look at them in their domain, doing what they do. And I find the work people do is particularly telling. And you can sort of paint that. So that's, that's one sort of observational type poem and I recommend it highly as a way to write something. And then um, this other one, um, uh, so it's another kind of, it's a little bit like a list poem, which is an excellent way, I think, to sometimes get things down where you 
um, see a lot of things and you put them in a list and see how that rolls out for you, but very specific details. So I just started that with this in mind about food, which of course we all share an interest in. Um, so this is called Things They Don't Tell You on Food TV, and I just tried to grab out of my mind things related to food and family for me. Um, I was quite surprised with where it went. Um, snapping off the ends of beans is like lips popping. A pork cookbook is the best place to find that picture of you and your mum at Taupo one summer. The turkey too late in the oven can make a grandmother cry with hunger. Come Easter and Crete, lambs are bloody sacks, milky mouths that kiss the small of your back. And eggplant is purpla when you call it aubergine. Aubergine is purpla when you call it melitzane. Another thing again when you call it Nelly Jane. Cracking eggs is an act of belief, whichever way you look at it, each time the epiphany. There's no better breakfast than a $3 special in a New York diner, watching her swallow every shred of yellow from the yolk, every lick of milk, every crumb. Fasting is not all it's cracked up to be unless it's in a monastery in Stokes Valley with an Italian, and dawn brings porridge and bells. At the end of a long day in the city, there's nothing better than tomato and oregano and garlic walking you up the path and the eldest son at the bench grating cheese. No better rice than his brothers are moulded from bowl to plate. Risotto works only when measured in handfuls by Mariella. Uno, due, tre, quattro. Zucchini flowers must be carried in two palms like a prayer. Father and feta are from the same family of words. You cannot make Yorkshire puds as good as your grands, no matter how hot the fat. Tea's best left to steep in the pot until Heather calls it time. Apples are sweetest in the hands of grinning brothers, untucked from tissues, their wooden box. Oysters are sweetest swallowed alone on a seawall. Beef's best cooked on hot charcoal, tended by laughing men. Olive oil should smell of the earth you walk upon and of the hands of the husband who crushes it. Asparagus is what asparagus is. Those apricots she poached each summer to eat under the umbrella are nothing short of sun blooming in a bowl and spooning yogurt and honey into the hungry mouth, into a hungry mouth on whitewashed steps with a turquoise sea and a donkey crowing and someone calling Kalimera into the bleaching light is just like scooping up the sun and eating it. <laughs> so that was just like coming at stuff and some things got put away and didn't get used and something that the opening got knocked out by my editor who just said, nah, everyone knows that. That's people all talk about that. It was took something to do with fresh fish. So everything needed to be my, you know, what they don't tell you on food TV. So I was just trying to pull out my own family stories of food. Mm -hmm. There's lots of radical attention in that book, yeah. isn't there? That's, I think that's a triumph of, of radical attention. Like really specific. Mm -hmm. very, like, very trying specific to like, knock it right down to its mm -hmm. little element that is just mine or that I would just know, like the Greek element. I've got my dad's type Greek and spent time in Greece, so you can hear all that particular mm -hmm. amount of like, through. And my grands from um, north of England makes the Yorkshire puts and all that. So, yeah. that's great. so that's it. So we thought you could do now, spend time. You've got your paper, enough paper to write on, and we, we've allowed a bit of time for this. We've allowed, are we really allowed 20 minutes? Gosh, that's, no, sure, no, 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 no. 10 minutes, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that would be a bit freaky. 20, 10 minutes. So what we thought was, um, we'd like you just to write concrete details. We'll tell you what about in a minute. Just the concrete details, things that come to you. You may have notes where you could rely on. But you're not to write about your feelings here. This is just the things that you're going to describe. And just remembering all five senses when you do that, because so many people get stuck on how things look and not how they smell or taste or sound. No? Yeah? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, it's thinking of some particular um, topic. Um, or area, and then just all the all the stuff, all the things associated with it. So it's a very specific piece of writing. It could it could be about anything. It could be going for a walk. It could be. It could, although we've got some ideas just in case that yes. freaks people okay. out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You've got to throw out <laughs> some, throw out some well, ideas. Mike, I don't mind if he's lying here saying most people are sitting there with an empty head. Because <laughs> before, I'd like to have an afternoon snooze now. But look, so one thing we thought was lockdown. Yeah. <clears throat> 
um, you know, the things that you obviously grab hold of will tell us a lot about how you found lockdown. They will, but don't don't put the emotion into it. Like, oh, there was a shit time, or oh, I love that. It was so chilled at home, or don't do any of that for me, or us, or my. Yeah. We don't want that. What we want is you to describe the details of. Like, I'm thinking. My husband and I went for a walk and found this one wild apple tree and we picked the apples and took them home. That's one memory because we don't often do that. <laughs> so it was yeah. kind of it was cool. The lockdown's one. Um, daily walk. That's another. Just what, you know, on a walk that you do regularly. I'm, I'm thinking of one like I've gone on the way to work. I see all sorts of interesting things. So I'm living in the city for part of the week and interesting things grabbed me. Um, we thought swimming or piano lessons from your childhood or now. You know, remembering that place in particular detail and just draw on your senses. And you know, just if we say these details, just list them if you want, line by line. Let them run on if you want down the page. Don't worry about the form of the poem. We just want the we just want this language coming out from you, and we want you to just keep writing. Don't kind of stop too much because in the act of writing, things come to you. For those of you who sit looking at your screen, I think it will tell you to be a writer. In the actual physical act of writing, things will emerge. Um, and what was the last one? Someone or something you love? Yeah. That could be a food, a, a meal, a person, an animal, someone you love. And of course, you can't be like I didn't look out the window and see your husband in the blue nightshirt, but you can think to a scene, like something typical of that person or animal. Um, and I, I do believe the physical things people do, like the, what the work they do, just yields you so much in terms of, it's brilliant too when you're writing characters in a novel, you know, showing in detail the work they do. Yeah. You know, how they operate in the world. So just give yourself permission to keep writing and then you know the refining and the dropping and the cutting could all yeah, come later. Yeah. No, this but is this is just the mind putting it down. And you don't have to share it at the end, you can keep it completely private. Um, and you don't have to edit it as you go. Please don't self-censor. Really important that you just write. And um, and if you think, oh God, what else? Just just focus on that thing um, and keep going. Pick a theme, obviously, and it may help some people to put that at the top of the page. It always helps me, something to hang a hook, to hang it on. If you put lockdown or daily walk, that just gives you something <coughs> to start with. And off you go. You've got 10 minutes, guys, so you can go for it. Oh, you do you, you're going to do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mean you're not? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Of course, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Run it out. What do you say? Some people are just writing notes. I really want you to be writing, writing, right? writing something that could be possibly a poem eventually.
So if you write on a concrete thing, kind of drill into it a bit more, don't just state it, like think what that thing is. Remember that sort of attention you can give it, which is, because there is a need for freshness in poetry, so it's your own attention to it, right? Um, something you might notice about that thing. And just keep going back to your senses. So many people are writing visually, which is fabulous, but just remember smell and taste. Sound. Sound, yeah. And rhythm is so important in that. Mm -hmm. And you just need to really concrete stuff. You know, concrete stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Concrete moments sometimes are just describing the day. Nice. Very Try and keep your feelings out, guys. Really hard. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> feelings are abstracts, eh? So you're wanting that real concrete stuff that's you're paying attention to. Where you write it down the side. Which one are you writing? Space for good, give me more on that specific thing. Yeah, just keep going into just all aspects, trying to see your way back yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah.
Sorry, I was right with these. I've got feelings. Yes, I've got some of mine. No, I can't do it without. Yeah. Because I actually do like mine. I'm not doing it anyway. Right, right. Ah, you can draw on that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, getting going. Yeah. Okay, oh, yes, you have to go. And I'm sorry, but Fanny's always coming to my place. Yeah, she's 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 we're probably slightly under, but we're probably looking at time. And we're probably, if, if people are okay to sort of cool it down now, wind it up. Yep. Okay, I'll just, yeah, let's just get you to the end of your sentence if you've got sentences. Stop them. Cool. Now, you don't have to share, but we thought, and we haven't got time to hear everybody, sadly, but I have had a look over shoulders, and there's some lovely work there and particularly you know always doing that over shoulder look you see writing it jumps out <laughs> oh thank you Steve. you know like if, if, if it's more specific the better it grabs your attention and that was of course what the exercise was about so is there anyone who'd like to share a little bit a few lines say five or six lines anybody Okay, locked out at home, can't leave, with PJs all day, with my mom being asleep, the old chair in the lounge, the groans, has now become all to me my home. The books that I've ignored on the shelf are now the only things classified as well. Photos of loved ones I can't see are the only family I see. Yeah, that's just Okay, so there's a lot going on there. I really like the chair who groans. <laughs> who yeah. groans? Because yeah. chairs do have personalities. Um, really, Mary, I think um, you've got the detail, but I think you've got to lose rhyme. Just get rhyme out of your head. Yeah, I, yeah, I rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> and good. the reason being is it limits, restricts you, limits you. You're not saying the best you could say, you know, because okay. you're yep. trying to find the rhyme. And so you're looking for something else, but we're we wanting, you know, you want to be focusing and finding that particular concrete detail, and there's some gorgeous details there. Well, that's very cool. cool. Got nice to, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Anyone else want to offer these up? Feel, feel confident. There's some lovely oh, writing out there. Yes. <laughs> yes, go. Kirsten. See me now riding my bike before school along up a plain road. Elderly Miss Peniston awaits in her one bedroom flat overpowered by her furniture polished piano. D, she plays D, and I know that one that sits below the line and sounds definite compared to the regal C. Kiki D on the tape deck drags me away from practice. E, or um, is, Winnie, is Winnie the Pooh's missing tail? I think that's how it went before bloody school. Super cool is not the place to admit to any abnormality such as piano lessons before school. Eek! The, the, the AM, I arose before the sun to do my once weekly pre practice for my preschool lesson to find young love coupled, um, coupled and copulating under a blanket in the practice room. Sadly, not with me, the hero of the first 15. If that time, Bumble tongue, no small talk around the pool table. Better settled to radio with pictures. Karen Hay, spoken word coolness and okay to nod along. Gee, I never told anyone I learned the piano. Bought my mother off with a promise to take the, to try the violin the following year. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole story in there. Yeah, it's <laughs> really cool. And, then, and I like that you just let it flow, just let it come out. And then you can, the next, because these are drafts, right? You can easily work up some of that stuff. There's so much coming at you. Fantastic. Anybody else? That's great. Very vivid. Very vivid. Oh, it's sort of right. Go. Mine's a bit. Okay, cool. Yeah. Year of piano lessons paid for by grandma. Just a bit louder. Year of piano lessons paid for by grandma. Year of torture. Browns of the 70s. Brown, a dark room by, by a dark wooded piano. Ivory keys, one stack. On a Saturday morning, 10 year old me wanted to play netball. Him sinking his cigarettes, dark eyebrows joined together in one line like the black keys on the piano. <laughs> Fagging while I played, or tried to. Ash falling on white keys that looked like bars of milky bar chocolate. 
the smell lingered after my awful Mary had a little lamb chewing. Tweed jacket, the colour of sheep shit, twined with darker thread, his breath sinking like his fags, smoke ingrained everywhere. Half an hour, the clock ticking, the timer on top of the piano being a drag. The light as he opened the door when I could be free. My grandma asking, how was it? Me saying, fine. The lie, Lorna, falling so easily off my lips to please her. Oh, really? What what stood out? Anyone? Any detail you can remember? Description, Description of the teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the eyebrows, like the, yes. the cigarettes, the cigarettes, the smoking. And you know what? She didn't say her feelings at all. I don't think, did you? But you can definitely tell she wasn't having a good time <laughs> by how she described it, like the jacket, like sheep shit, and things like that. Very cool. Okay, any, one more from anyone? Do you want to share? Don't have to. Don't have to. I'll do it. Okay, remain. Outside, the lavender is pushing itself into spring, racing the rosemary, remembering, sorry, it's my answer, the kohai yellow, um, the, the two. <laughs> the tui clacking as as the hearse pulled up, the opening of the gate and its protest. These are strangers. They will change things. The two men speak quietly, move slow through the the window that can be seen opening the stretcher on wheels. Then leaning over the bed, the nod. the nod, the lift, the placing of her on the trolley, the slow walk back through the house. Wow, wow. yeah, well that's um, an example, isn't it, of yeah, just concrete particular detail and, mm. and it takes gives you that, all that emotion, isn't it? Um, and then and the, that sort of pivot point of um, these are strangers, they will change things, you know, so you have a sense of something, the meaning behind it, I guess, or you're warned a little bit at that point, but then you just take us right there. But starting with the particularity of the lavender. That's the interesting thing, isn't it, that the, de the concrete details you actually focus on do reveal the emotion, mm -hmm. I think. So when you said not to write about emotion yeah. directly, but you are actually right you know, when you are very specific and pay radical attention and what you choose to pick out does actually convey you know the emotion yeah. and, and it, it lets the reader in doesn't yeah, it, it does. uh, because often you pick, give them a big feeling and you push it at them like oh this is really sad or this is very yeah. um you know it's a sentimental sort of piece about deep love and all that it, it can just turn people out off so what they need is to be given things and they can step forward and and take them from you and uh, and that was a, a case in point it was a big story but we we were let in and could feel it so we easily then we um amazing thanks Renee. and thank you everyone for giving it a go some people didn't find it as easy as they thought and others did some want their feelings up first and now uh, i'd really recommend you try and work on that, <laughs> tuck them away, because you'll show them anyway. And poetry is so much about those details and about also things being fresh. So those, any detail, finding your own, you know, the jacket, like sheep shit, hey, told us a lot there, right? And his gorgeous brows. So all of those things are vital. Um, so now we want to go to the next stage. Um, so we've got another 20 minutes, Mike. So... Um, you were going to quickly talk about the trigger and discovery thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a favourite um, quote of mine from Billy Collins, that poem, often a good poem has two subjects, a starting subject and a discovery subject. And I've, that just had the ring of truth for me, because I think the best poems, you don't quite know what you're going to write until you get into it. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, the best ones, I, you know, I, I, I don't know where to start, but I don't know where this is going to quite go and then I end up the good ones I'm happy where it's gone the others are into the into the waste 
take a bin. So I thought that's a really, really nice way of looking at it. Two subjects, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you start and you get in often on a concrete specific thing and then it, it takes you somewhere. So this is a poem I wrote um, about an experience with my little grandson, which is a bit like that. So it's, um, it's called Crumbs. Baxter wants us to feed the birds. We are in this together. My job is to throw the bread up to the raised plateau where the wax eyes and sparrows swoop down from the old plum tree. He breaks the bread into large pieces and then, unblinking, breaks what's left again and again and passes it to me very carefully for dispatch until all the birds are fed and we are face to face and he is smiling at me from a tumble of blonde hair and together we are trying to separate the last crumb to make of it two crumbs, to make this communion go on forever. So, it, you know, the specific, trying to be very, very specific about the crumb, but um, that was, I mean, that was one poem that I felt happy with that it had the two subjects, it had the starting subject and it had the, the discovery which subject. Which was the communion, the, the communion. gorgeous yeah. last line which kind of shot it out. Yeah. It? Yeah. So we're not saying you can't make those points, not you, but you can't find the abstract and put it there, but you almost, like you said earlier, Mike, you need to earn that, earn it. Yes. Give us enough, give the reader enough so they can see it too. They're starting to feel it. They're, they're starting to get it, right? And that's gorgeous, that gorgeousness, that last little crumb that you're breaking. Then yeah. Mike brought in that lovely element, which is him, his view, and taking this out, mm. the, the communion. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's important to say that you've got a bit of a religious background. So that's yeah, I suppose the spiritual thing does interest me a lot. Mm. Um, and how to write about that in a way that's not narrowly religious or cliched, but is actually about the life of the spirit. And, you know, so in connecting the, the concrete external world to that world of the spirit and what uplifts it. Um, yeah. That was a... Um, just back on my other theme for a second, there's a, there's a line in one of the poems there. I had a, a good, a lot of my stuff seems to be related to cancer, I don't know why. But this wonderful <laughs> friend who died of cancer, a very healthy chap, and out of nowhere he got a terrible cancer. But he, the way he dealt with it was phenomenal. He was a very spiritual guy. And, he, uh, and one day, he, um, we were standing in his, in his um, garage and he put his hands out and he said, I can count on the fingers of one hand, he said, the times it's really got me down since I got the news. I said, Jesus, mm -hmm. is that right? And he said, he said, you know, um, I've always, you know, I'm curious, you know, so this is what it's like to die. And I thought, wow, that, that curiosity he had about everything in life, he mm -hmm. actually was bringing to this hardship mm -hmm. and to the ultimate hardship, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that was, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that stuck with me, you know, that curiosity, even about hard things, you know, to see that as a wonderful subject for writing, you know, so, so that's, you know, some, quite a bit of my stuff is, is around that, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, so we thought now we'd um, suggest you uh, look at what you've written and find your best um, couple of lines or line or image and one that just ping might something in you, just that you put it down and had the thought you would, that you really like, that you think you've written really well, um, and we'd like you to, that to be your trigger for a poem. So these, I guess, are, this is a draft, very much just a, a mass of imagery. Some people have created something more whole, like Renee, who's became a piece, so she's going to have trouble finding a, an element, but you might want to take something out of that and make something else of it. Take a fresh page now. Um, and write those lines at the top, um, and you're going to write from them. Again, for not, probably 10 minutes, or maybe eight, eight minutes, see how we go. Um, and it's important to bear in mind this idea that, um, yeah, that you, as you're keeping writing, you're continuing to grab for the concrete, you're continuing to pay radical attention to what's around you, but now you can slide in a little bit, I guess, of something like the communion line, you know, something that could come to you as a comment on what's happening. 
or something a little bit broader that can take you further through that poem, that moment like Renee had of this is a mo these are strangers, everything's going to change. There's no reason you can't put that in now. But think hard about those things. Don't just throw them in willy-nilly and please don't throw in masses of feelings and big abstractions. Try and keep yourself <coughs> grounded because that's what the concrete does. It's hard on the floor grounded stuff. Yeah. And from that, you can just send up a tendril or two. Yeah, a little imaginative leap from it. the concrete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but th and this, an important part of this is finding your voice, because that will be you saying that. It will be your interpretation of what we're saying. And no one else could have done it. Your background, who you are, is what Tom Conroy was talking about earlier today, is the compost for your writing. And it's mm -hmm. like only you can be saying it. And don't be afraid of it and don't self-censor, let it out, because you'll be surprised at what you produce, I think. So go for it, grab the, you know, take a minute if you need to, to look at what you've written, <coughs> circle the line you like, or the phrase or the image, something that, and you can go in any direction with it, you don't, you can ignore all this now, that's on the, you're not necessarily going there, you're going where that takes you, it can take you anywhere. You can start writing about mushrooms and end up talking about feeding the ducks, doesn't matter.
say you would be pushing the boundaries mm -hmm. too much for this man. You're, you're putting a little bit of your own self in there in the white light, just give me some conscience. And it's something about white is mm -hmm. This is cool. It's not here any now. Is the new version. Mm. So, do you want to go abstract? Because they're like this abstract kind of word. Mm. Mm. Then you've got some interesting language going on. Mm. Okay, give me a repetition of what else we're doing. Mm. Mm. So, this is about creating mm. mm. So these are humans, but they're the ones that have been in the us and those to, to take the humans remain to the eternal. It's really particular about some people. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, 
<laughs> Sorry to interrupt, some of you are sort of book like, feel free to finish them off later or even after this, maybe a little bit of time just to keep writing. Um, you yeah, just sort of finish, I hate to interrupt and okay. in full flight. Um, but thank you for sharing your ability of letting me look at it as you're doing it. There's some really nice, sorry, nice to see uh, um, ideas taken away from where they started from. And some people who are, um, were perhaps sort of flailing around a bit with feelings and what to do with them, have now thrust them aside and come out with something <coughs> that still has their feelings and certainly has more of their voice in it, but based around sort of the concrete, which is so cool. Um, would you like to read yours? Okay. You, did so, you just made such a leap between your drafting and this one. Do you, would you like to or not? Um, yeah, I could do it. Just, I don't know, just reading back, it seems to be juvenile. No, go for it. Um, it started with the whole lockdown thing. I was, yeah, the other one I did was just terrible, so my feelings were just horrible. Um, um, lockdown smells like doughy wafts from my bread machine, cinnamon sultan and an evil white flower which tastes like your blessing. Casserole turns into a curry with careful shapes and sweets jarring and homemade naan. From its bowels it throws forth summer picnics, Friday pizza nights and a satiation to pen and tea cravings. A power cut is a snapping of the staff of life. And a Saturday winter lunch with no cheese toasty beside the soup feels like a menu with a page missing. <laughs> the insistent leaps of a completed cycle of the Carillion calling to worship. That's why I went on. Well, what do we think? I just think it's really cool. great. Yeah. <laughs> really, the first more time. out the words. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the first time through, there was just the, the, the feeling. It was and, terrible. So, <laughs> so what I love is you can hear her voice, right? The evil white flower that tastes like a blessing. I just mm. love it. Like, yeah, right. We all like that white flower cooked up. <laughs> anyway, so well done. Anyone else want to share one? If you've been before, would you like to share yours? Oh, yeah. Nice and loud. Nice and loud. Other white mushrooms fill the farmer's fields. COVID says don't touch. Memory reminds me the fungi are the biggest structures on the planet. Do they too want to escape from the COVID confines? Use their tentacles to explore. Meander endlessly through the fence, under us, under the road. They must come up to breathe, to search for fresh air away from the dark, moist fields. Where are they? Uh, look on the public side of the fence for signs and for food. Yeah, I like that. We foraging. I think that needs a cut too. I, I really, yeah, a lot of people did do foraging, didn't they? It became a thing. But I think I love the way you've just let yourself go with it. Like you've taken that line which was out of a you know lot of observations, yeah, and you've good. just let it roll and gone a bit crazy with these leaf mushrooms. Very nice. I'd love to see where, where further you go. Anyone else want to share theirs? Mandy, do you want to share a little bit of your great? Piece of writing about mm -hmm. overalls and a man okay. in them. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. I kind of just carried on, so I wanted to read the whole thing. 
He wears blue overalls, puts them on in the morning, boxes his t-shirt, that ludicrous checked bush shirt, <coughs> then the overalls, bulked out by bush shirt, distorting his shape, not spelt man, but square, <coughs> bulk the builder, cut out a uniform, <coughs> code for the working class roofs he both loves and hates. There are two pairs on rotation in the wash, draped over a clothes source to dry out the myriad pockets. A broken builder's pencil escaping from the washing machine, a screw, a bolt, a linen handkerchief, not bloody tissues, mm -hmm. a waste for temporary. <laughs> they, can be, they can come to the wash pile beige with wood chips, battered with paint, pink spots of grease. Yet they never smell like him, no matter what. The toil, the skin stays as sweet smelling as his nature. No de deodorant hidden from, no sour cut of sweat. The only signs he has laboured, the smear of brown under his sky blue eye. The pockets bulge, phone, extra glasses, that little illegal pipe and red bit lighter. <laughs> the musty, distinctly weedy vapours seeping out of the small orange plastic egg it's encased in. A kinder surprise for the ageing boomer. <laughs> a <rapid> <laughs> choice <laughs> by slowing his brain and opening it, removing the chatter. Sending his mind into free form, drafting windowsills, measuring shelves, planning how to limb the giant oak on his own, imagining ropes, angles, all paths, calculating the cords of firewood and the limb um, of the cords of firewood the limb will provide on winter nights. He slips on his boots, steel cap scuffed, scratch across, grounding him as he grounds us. We joke at those overalls, run Reckon will lay him out in them when he dies, and they will announce to the world, here lies a man who worked to feed us, house us, lift us up. A man who grafted himself into our broken family and grew into our collective DNA. Here lies a man who will say, leave it to me, I'll fix that, or come into my arms and I will fix you, mm -hmm. believing it is his work to make us smile, to feed our souls, to stake the foundations of our family together, until they are so strong we can hold each other up, symbiotic, able to turn our faces to the sun, but equally able to weather the storms. Mm. Oh, so she she wrote the so she didn't take she took her whole draft yeah. <laughs> and that was and she just continued. So she moved from the con very much the concrete. The man, the overalls, that lovely descriptions, what's in his pockets, etc., through to suddenly that the communion line, really, yeah. where well, you, yeah, you gave right. us the communion, the, yeah. the <laughs> final, and sort of take you know, the man well, into the family. Wonderful, wonderful example of the two subjects, isn't it? Your starting yeah. subject mm. and then your discovery mm. subject, where you, there we go. And the the of of <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It's just good. it's just beautiful that and it made me feel emotional because it instead yeah. of saying to you, I'm gonna tell you this, you know, I love this guy, this is what he does, you 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 just showed us yeah. him mm. through your eyes. Yeah. And we could see all those he wrote those pockets ago. Yeah, it's and brilliant. it's it's really and you're good. drawn in by the language <laughs> and the telling. And you at the same time you're seeing your own stuff that's similar, you know. I'm mm. thinking I did my Tree guy, <laughs> you've got your man and overalls. It's really, cool. really lovely. Yeah. You feel like you've had that experience. You shared it with the writer, and that's all what writing's about too. You, that you're experiencing something, and you're hearing it, you're breathing it, um, and it takes you into a good place that you want to be moved and feel it. Lovely. Anyone else? Um, Nicola, you haven't read anything. Do you want to read no, yours? Um, well, maybe. <laughs> Only if you just, want to. Um, I didn't sort of really do the second half. Um, I don't know whether to call it attachment parenting, which initially it was, or when you said nice and loud, I was like, nice and loud. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, the book said, the closer you attended to the needs of the child and the faster you were there to nurse your coursing milk, to change the pole of these nappies, to rock and pat and nurse some more to sleep, to speak her name and to the story being of her young life, to play with and play back to or just be with the more independent, the more resilient young person you would eventually enable to be. Which sounded great, but it was hard to believe when she would catnap between left alone cries of never more than three minutes, when she would knead and knead at the nipple, then fall off, mouth agape, eyelashes locked like Venus flytraps. This happening up to five times a night during two years of teething, and you had to put her down on a sweet milky mattress by 
a perceptible stealth, lest she cry away again, which she did, and she did, and because she was the first and the only, you could not know when the promised day of the book still come. And when it finally came at 11, <laughs> no, 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 I don't know if it's she's I'm just saying that. <laughs> and when it finally came, it was a blunt shock, like having her push an empty pram at speed through the trails of your heart. Her whittled stick, her nightlight, her kata karate across the bountiful bed, her 50 press ups and sit ups, no heater on all winter in that small room. Rare curling ins for cuddles and kisses, touch on her own terms, and then you saw it for what it is. Oh, that's oh, really that's really cool. Cool. an unusual topic, but lovely. Yeah, that's that's cool. You took us on your story <laughs> at 11. That's very good. Um, I know it's, have we got time for two quick more reads? If anyone, no, we have to stop. This minute. Sorry, <laughs> anyone who missed out, come and, come and read it to me if yes, you want to. Yes, We'd love that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks thanks everybody. That's it. Um, book, if you know everyone's books that are for sale, the library has them if you want to buy the books of any presenters. Mine's mine are there, but there are some other writers there. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.